Okay, so if you haven't yet, please mute your microphone. Uh, and welcome to the ninth edition of the Fusion EP Talks tonight by Milos Vlainis. Is that correct pronunciation? Vlainis. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and Dr. Vlainic is uh, from the Institute of Physics in Belgrade, and he was part of the 2011 Fusion EP cohort. And uh, he did his uh, master thesis in TJ2 on ion temperature and velocity profiles. Um, then moved on to the, PhD, the European PhD program, the Fusion DC, uh, to work on runaway electrons, which are the topic of tonight. Welcome, Milos, and you have the floor. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, thank you for a nice introduction. So, as he already said, I will talk about runaway electrons. At the moment, just to say, I'm in Novi Sad, even though I work in Belgrade. This is the logo you can see on the left. It's Institute of Plasma Physics in Belgrade. Uh, Institute of Physics in Belgrade. Um, used to, I was working actually on runaway electrons in the Institute of Plasma Physics in Prague. This was part of the kind of continuation of the Fusion EP program, which was called Fusion DC. And it was partnership between uh, Ghent University and the Czech Technical University. Uh, I will talk mostly about random electrons. It will be just production because this should be like a, a ma uh, for master students. I will not talk about any results, but there are plenty in the, in the extra slides. So I give you some introduction uh, to what random electrons are, how they get generated in the tokamax, why they are uh, relevant for ether, and also at the end uh, you will see how you can uh, observe them in, in uh, fusion plasma. Uh, beside that, at the end I will just mention the, the, the work I'm doing now in the Institute of Physics. Okay. So introduction, and yeah, don't be afraid that the bottom you can see there is 60 slides, the last slide is 25th, the rest is extra. So uh, what's happening here, uh, how do they occur? So as you might know, most of you, you all know something about fusion and plasma, uh, you have uh, continuous in, uh, and uh, the closed loop of the interaction between the electric field, electromagnetic field, and the charged particles in plasma. And they uh, practically slow down each other due to the Coulomb forces. And this is, when you look at the, the when you sum up all the Coulomb forces from each particle on one single particle, you, this particle sees this as a, some collision of friction. And it slows down. And this happens with most of the particles. However, in a tokamax, you have quite strong electric field, which comes uh, intrinsically from the transformer effect, how you generate plasma current in the tokamak. So you have also this electric field, which accelerates the, the charged particles. And now from charged particles, I'll jump to electrons because they are much lighter and the protons are not really relevant for us at the moment. So you have the fight between this collision and this acceleration, and there is a distinct possibility that uh, some particles could be accelerated so much that they go in the region where the, the friction force drops with squared velocity. So you, this is what you can see on the right here. So this is a friction force. At some point, this friction force goes under the accelerating force coming from the electric field. Because the electric field uh, acceleration from the electric field doesn't depend on the velocity, it's constant. So you have this critical velocity uh, about which the, the electron practically becomes uh, uh, infinitely, no, yeah. theoretically it becomes infinitely accelerated. Of course it goes to almost speed of light or it hits the wall. It really depends. So, but anyway, as I said, it's relativistic, so it can uh, have tens, or it was even recorded, I think, in TFTR 
and to our supra almost like hundreds of mega electrons. Those are really high energies. And when you have a lot of them, they can have a lot of current. They can carry a lot of current and then can really have a lot of energy, a lot of current, a lot of magnetic energy, a lot of kinetic energy. And when they hit the wall, they can really uh, make a severe damage to plasma facing components and first wall. So yeah, this is the main motivation. You can see it on the picture on the right. This is taken from jet and you can see a runaway literally melted the steel. This is what happened with when the ether like wall was introduced to jet. And it was never really 100% proven, but the main, uh, the main uh, guilty guys are runaway electrons. Okay, so just a little bit of history. Yeah, well, we always have some lectures. They always tell us, tell us what happened before, right? So the, the term run of electron is not nothing, is nothing new. It's nothing fusion uh, uh, only fusion related. It was introduced by, the Wils by Wilson, you know, the, the Wilson chamber guy. So he introduced it when he was explaining uh, thunderstorms in his, uh, in his book of like uh, which I forgot, in his article when he wanted to explain the lightning, yeah, thunderstorms. Then in astrophysics and solid state physics, uh, in '49 you can see it's even before the fusion started to be the mainstream research in plasma physics. And then also in the bare beginning of Troid experiments, uh, Soviets were the ones who. Uh, recorded runaway electrons. They recorded their uh, hard accelerator radiation. So let's see a bit more, in more, bit more details. Let's be a bit more formal and mathematical about their generation. So what I explained on the first slide was actually primary mechanism or Dreiser mechanism. It's named by Dreiser because he was the one who actually explains, explained the mechanism how, how they are generated. So notice that this is around 60 while Wilson introduced the term 30, 35 years uh, before, but they still didn't know how actually they are generated. So here you have the same slide. Here you have the full friction force. Of course, this is not the scale. Uh, and uh, you have a Dreiser field. This is one of the important terms. However, Dreiser field is the top. So this is the field when, the, when in theory, all electrons will become runaway. This never happens in nature but it's a term, a very important term because it's important for the theorists. Uh, okay, so what's happening actually is, uh, is here on the bottom slide. So you have the bottom uh, figure. You have a distribution function over the velocity. So usually we uh, approximate it as Maxwellian. And what's happening, as I said, there is distinct, if you remember in the beginning, I said there is distinct possibility that there are some particles will cross this critical velocity. Sorry for that sound, that's my younger daughter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so, practically, what's happening is, uh, is the flow of this um, particle near this critical velocity inside the random electron region. And it's happening constantly. It's a, it's a statistical process. Yeah. It's not something that occurs once or something. So it's happening always. Uh, and then, uh, because uh, the the this this rate is only dependent on the constant of the electric field, uh, it's linear increase. And this is the first article. Okay, there's linear increase in the in the runaway electron uh, population. However, there is a secondary mechanism, also called avalanche mechanism. You can see on the bottom left the, the figure from the from the uh, Alexis. Uh, how should I say commercial of my <laughs> of my talk? So here, what's happening? Is not only that the the, the electrons from the near critical velocity region, they inflow into runaway region, but then the already runaway electron, he kicks on, he knocks on the, the thermal regular electron, and then the regular electron becomes runaway and the, the primary one 
stays on away. And of course, you have the exponential increase, and that's why this is called an avalanche effect. And this is this was not really uh, observed till like uh, beginning of the 90s. They're not sure why this is happening, why there is so much electrons, and uh, electrons. Uh, and then in D3D and uh, JET and uh, Tor Supra, they finally explained this. And the main article uh, was in 1997 by famous plasma physicists Rosenbold and Putvinsky. Yeah, so that's the second effect. Then you have something else. So you have a, so something which is called a critical field. Even though I think this should be called a threshold field, this is not to me to decide. But the problem is that you here have a critical velocity which tells you what is the minimum velocity for a random electron to become a random electron, right? But then, critical field is a theoretical term. So the Dreiser didn't include relativistic. Uh, theory in calculation of electrons, which are relativistic, which is kind of funny, but he didn't do it. So this was done by Conrad and Hesty in 75, 15 years after Dreiser. And when they included that, if you look back to Dreiser, the equation looks the same, except that this temperature has changed, changed for the mass of the electron, of course, in energy unit or temperature unit, how you like it. So this critical electrical field represents something that, so if here represents the minimum field when random electrons can be generated. So you can see that this friction force, it decreases with V square, but then here after a critical electric field, it becomes constant. So in theory, if this line would go down, so you decrease the electric field in the tokamak, it will be under this field, and there will be no mean of creation around electrons. And this will be the situation for, their not to occur, for them not to occur. So this is cool, no round of electron production, no damage, yeah? And this actually happens in the, today, like already for 30 years, in a flat top, uh, uh, so flat top means like the, nor the, the main part of the uh, tokamak discharge, uh, or also in ether, it should be like that when there is a normal, uh, when there is a normal uh, crescent shot. Yeah, this is the main article, and there uh, you can call this a bully free zone. Yeah, there is no damage, and there is uh, there is a certain experimental evidence this threshold could be even higher three to ten times it's now depends on the on the error bar and uh, and who did the experiment in which machine and stuff like that so i'm not going to details what could be the reason it's still in discussion for like already like six seven years the article is from 2014 but this started before so my 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 personal main candidate could be sector radiation because when you have a uh, sector radiation, it goes with gamma, the, the, the Lorentz factor in relativity theory, gamma to fourth. So, which means that the electron, as faster he, it goes, it more radiates. And then, you can, as you can see here, it, it, you can see it also as an additional friction force. So, you can see this the increase of sphetron. Again, this is a mock up. And when you sum it up, you can see that the effective critical uh, electric field could be somewhere here, which is above the theoretical one coming from the runaway, uh, from the relativistic effects. And then you could have uh, like a pile up zone here because our electrons do not want to slow down, but then they can speed up. So you can have a pile up zone, and this occurs as a bump in the distribution function, just to plot return. So you would see like this, you have drop, and then you have here a bump, like this. This actually uh, was uh, calculated and proven that in some in simulations, 
that in bigger machines this bump actually occurred in some experiments. So this is not so unrealistic. But still, it's a dis in discussion even now. And just to, this is just an example, very brief. So in the IA book about future physics, I found something about uh, that there is a possibility that uh, the the uh, re fusion reactor energetic particles like alpha and beta and gamma rays could also generate uh, random electrons, but then apparently this is wrong. So I just want to tell you, as to my students, that you don't you shouldn't believe all these the books blindly, but should check those stuff. Yeah. Anyway, I go further. So now I go to ether, because you might wonder. Uh, why the hell are am I talking now about our electrons when I already said that in a reactor like uh, Pokemon, this will not be a problem because the electric field inside the plasma will be under the electric in, under the critical electric field. So why am I telling you to, telling you this? Well. I, as I said, I said this, that this is all okay in a flat top, but a uh, flat top uh, can abruptly stop with disruption. And disruption itself is a bad news. But then, if you include that there is an additional mechanism during disruption for generation of planetary electrons, that's even bad news to square because what's happening? This was actually uh, first occurred, uh, first uh, uh, not occurred, but uh, found experimentally in, um, in D3D and theoretically explained by Smith in a series of articles from 2005, 2009. So what's happening is that you have a plasma temperature drops suddenly. This is what's happened in all the sections. Uh, this is normal, yeah. And then uh, uh, the point is that then the distribution function, which was like smooth just before reception during the flat top, you have this main part which cools down. It cools down while the the the, the tail of the distribution function, there the, these particles of electrons are too fast and they cannot really cool down that fast. So. And what's happening is that uh, due to the incre decrease of the main temperature, the probability, so, so the runaway electron region, the critical velocity is, de is decreasing. And then these guys, even they, if they were not runaway electrons before the disruption, due to the uh, fast changes in the plasma parameters, they become runaway electrons. Simply, they just occur uh, due to the change of the environment, let's say, of the, of the plasma parameters. Yeah. And then they become random electrons. And then, if you remember, we have avalanche again. And then this cocktail mechanism, and probably they could occur also some bracer mechanism, they all. Uh, uh, undergo, they could undergo interior orange mechanism, which they usually do in big tokamaks. And then what happens is that you have like, this is a shot from jet out of two megaamps amp, uh, current before the disruption, you have more than a half megaamps or more than 25% of the plasma current is driven by random electrons. And this is the main problem why random electrons are important. For ether, because there, you, most calculations showed the most. Actually, this is the most I think optimistic one. That showed that the factor of multiplication of avalanche effect will be 10 to 20. Some even go to 10 to 25, which I think is too much because there will not there will be probably so much particles. But yeah. so and the estimations of the current are not 25 like in jet, but 60 to 70 percent. And if you take into account that there will be like 10 megaamp currents, this means seven uh, megaampers of current in the 
driven by their altruistic uh, electrons uh, with uh, like uh, 50 mega electron volts. That's extreme helical magnetic load on the on the not so let's say a rigid uh, first wall of ether. As you know, uh, you saw that in the beginning the motivation picture where uh, run electrons melted steel in jet, and steel is much more robust than than beryllium wall or uh, whatever will be in, in some fusion reactor in future. So yeah, the point is that we have to control somehow uh, electrons to meet, or at least if they occur, to mitigate them. So on the left, yeah, you can see that the, the, the ideal world, it would be very nice to control the runaway beam and to slowly diminish it to zero current. However, unfortunately, it's not very possible because, for example, uh, uh, ITER at the, at the moment is not really designed to have uh, to have fast, to have fast uh, current uh, control above two megaamps, uh, and the, and uh, so the point is that the fast change the, in the in the current, the fast uh, control uh, will not be able to re uh, handle it because it's too much current. However, the one that controls the 10 megaamp normal discharge, it will be too slow to handle it. So uh, this, is a, this was not foreseen, and also they are not really sure how they can change this, because it's, it's too difficult uh, from the physics point of view. Then, uh, they are, what are people doing now, actually? They are trying to suppress the avalanche effect, so to, at least to stop the, uh, the, so this multiplication factor to be 10 to 20, but maybe to be 10 to 5, 10 to 10, or whatever. So the main uh, uh, rays are the massive gas injection. So you just, uh, uh, just put a lot of uh, massive gas inside the tokamak or some kind of deconfinement. So like uh, making a field, not confining field, but deconfining field, like stochastic field or even uh, in some way uh, increasing this critical field and you, you can do this by just increasing the density which is this massive gas injection so yeah that's about uh, the ether or this is relevant and this is just a brief overview of the diagnostics i mostly used but then also there are some which i never used i will mention it so there is radiation detection of electrons so when they hit the wall, you can have like a Bramstrong because the electrons, as I said, they are relativistic. They are, when they hit the wall, they are stopped very fast in a few collisions. So they lose all our energy and radiation. Uh, usually it's hard X-ray, can be in soft X-ray uh, radiation, but if you have a lot of them, at highly energetic, they can be even gamma region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Then you can have a Bramstrong from in-fight this is in soft X-ray, hard X-ray. This was not used on compass. This is usually done in jet. And this is called so-called uh, FEB, which is the fast uh, electron Bramstrom. Then you have strict radiation. This is somewhere between visible and uh, near infrared. And this is what I was using a lot with infrared camera in Compass, and this was one of my chapter synthesis was about this. But the, yeah, I just mentioned that hard X-ray and gamma were also normally used in Compass. There was EC, electron cyclotron emission, so you have this gyration of electrons, and this is usually used in uh, tokamaks for temperature measurement, but it can also be used for uh, electron measurement, but then it gets a bit more complicated, and I wanted to do this, but then uh, it, was, it was too much. But now it's using compass. Then you have particle detection. So you have Cherenko radiation. I don't know how much, how many of you are familiar with Cherenko radiation. It's actually uh, radiation that comes from the relativistic particle inside the media, or, uh, it's a material that uh, goes 
uh, faster than the speed of light in that material. So not, the fa not faster than the speed of light in the vacuum, but speed of, faster than the speed of light in that material. And then you have this generic radiation. This is the, the, so the, the source of the blue light, let's like, say, in fission, in a fission uh, nuclear power plants. So you, what, what, how the electron was detected, you would usually put like a probe, some material in the, in the scrap of layers. So this is a layer between the confined plasma and the wall. You put some material there and then you have a lost electron, which is outside plasma but before hitting the wall. It goes through some material. It was usually a diamond. And then you have the gentle light and you have the optics that leads the radiation again towards the detector. And then you have photoneutrons. Now this is a bit more complicated. So you have, a, again, electron, it's, it hits the wall, but then it can uh, go, it, uh, there is no Bremsstrahl, but uh, visible, but this Bremsstrahl is in gamma, and this gamma ray then interacts with the same material, and then this gamma ray expels neutron from the nuclei. And then you have high energetic neutrons. And then you, you can also then, this, this is, uh, if, you, if you detect the photoneutron, this is a proof of high energetic, like, I don't know, 10 to, to 30 megatrons. And activation probes, this was supposed to be actually my PhD thesis, but then the, the, my, the, the mentor of mine went to politics in Brussels, so then I had changed to run electrons, uh, but activation probes are done only in jet. What you have, you have a nuclear activation of some material that you put inside the tokamak, and then after you take it out, and then you unfold uh, this active, uh, this radiation. What's happening? And stuff like that. It's quite complicated, and it's not uh, real time. It's uh, post mortem uh, detection. And then you have, of course, magnetic coils. You can use uh, them for a bunch of things. Uh, like direct current estimation. This was my last article of uh, on electrons. It was published uh, this January. You can reconstruct the lo their localization. This was also my attempt in the thesis. Magnetic perturbations. This is what they do now. Active ring compass, magnetic loads. Uh, the point is that yeah. So when the, uh, the when the whole beam approaches the wall, then it can interact with the wall electromagnetically and it can uh, literally break the wall under these forces. Then you can also analyze the beam drift. So because the beam, we have videos how the beam even moves. And there are some theoretical connections with alpha and waves. It's also investigated in compass. And if you notice now on the bottom right, you will see this is 25th slide. So this, for the summary, I hope you catch up something from the generation from our elements, why it is important for ether. And I think I explained you here in sh very briefly almost all that is possible at the present time. And before I end, I would just like to say what I'm doing now. At the moment, I'm for a year employee at the Institute of Physics, as I said in Belgrade, and I am uh, furnishing some vacuum ultraviolet uh, spectrometer, which should uh, be used for a, a fusion plasma uh, spectroscopy. So the, the idea is to have some measurements of uh, deuterium lines in the, this region and uh, the helium lines and maybe even beryllium, you will see in carbon lines, and then to improve the diagnostics in this region because this region is not really well uh, uh, investigated. Yeah, so thank you for listening, and that will be it. Alexis. Thank you so much for this very nice talk, Milos. Yeah. And uh, if anybody has questions from now on or want to discuss further on the topic, you're welcome to do so by raising your hand in the participant box. Okay. Let me see, but it's a box raising the hand. Okay. No questions. <laughs>
<laughs> it was maybe too difficult. <laughs> okay. Alexis, do you have some questions? Yeah, I could I can have a question if there's no other questions for now. Uh, could you go back to that slide when you were talking about how runaway electrons could slow down? I, I think that's what I understood. Could slow down because they radiated. Ah, okay. This one. Is that the right understanding, or did I? Yeah, that's exactly that. So you could see that. Um, you can you can look at so this is mathematically uh, the, the charged particle radiates it loses the energy so it's practically getting slowed down right and this is just on this slide it's just added as additional friction force that's the idea there are a few others but this is the most realistic one let's see and would you be able to use that to uh mitigate or prevent uh um runaways uh they to force them to radiate before they uh become too not, not really yeah because this signal radiation as i said it goes with the gamma to four gamma is the this lorentz factor if i don't know have, have you had relativistic uh, theory but there is this lorentz factor which defines the how the mass or whatever increases or decreases so because it goes with gamma to four this uh, friction force occurs very late. So even, so this pileup zone is already uh, quite energetic, let's say. Electrons, this just stops them to go to, I don't know, 100 meg mega electron volts, but still they reach like 20, 30, 40 mega electron volts. So not really, you cannot force it just like that. So, so the synchrotron radiation, it happens as they gyrate in the toroidal direction? Or is, is it, does it also happen uh, along their like, cyclotron motion? Yeah, I had this discussion with my professors. So usually, yeah, when you say cyclotron radiation in acceleration physics, they gyrate along the accelerator, right? As you said, the toroidal direction, right? But here, actually, this is not the case completely. Because you know that in, in, uh, in, in, in fusion plasma, particles gyrate around the like, field, which goes like this. Because in the accelerator, the magnetic field is put normal to the to the torus. Here it's along the torus, right? So particles generate along the torus. Around the magnetic field, yeah. So and the signal radiation is simply an effect when the particles become relativistic, then you have this uh, the you know the I would say the I mean, it helps now. I forgot. You know, when you have uh, the space around you uh, changes, right? The, 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 the space distribution. Oh, like length contraction? Yes, length contraction. This was the English word. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So, because of that, in the reference system of the particle, it radiates normally like Bremstrong, everything like. Uh, you would see like clouds like this, like front and back, you know. However, in our laboratory system, they all go forward mostly because of the relativistic effect, because of this uh, length contraction and time duration. Everything. So they still, it is due to the generation around the magnetic field, so like this, mm -hmm. but because of their, because their speed is faster around the torus, it's pointed towards this uh, uh, towards this direction as in accelerator. Okay. So it's not like in accelerator you have it comes from this from this generation and it is directed towards the direction of the movement. However, here it's not like that. it's a bit more complicated. But at the end, uh, macroscopically the effect is the same and the physics of the radiation is the same. Uh, sorry, I had this discussion with my professors because oh, it's because this. No, it's not because of that. It's because of gyration or magnetic field. It's what I mentioned here. The EC electrocytochrome. I don't know how the are you familiar with that? The electrocytochrome emission. So it simply just comes from this gyration. And radiation is just a relativistic version of EC. 
Mm -hmm. It's the it's the, the gyration, but then they're going really fast. So you, yes. it depends on the yeah the frame. Rate. And when you asked about that, maybe I can show you just some pictures. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this was how we observed it. So we had the camera here, and we could observe everything from this region, the green region, and this is what we got the pictures. Yeah, these are the pictures we got. They look quite nice, I would say. So. Yeah. So sometimes we had the issues, for example, this bottom left, when the camera saturates because it was not designed for that, and then you had the reflection here of the wall, or here, but then there was this beauty which was more or less the, the most direct visual observation of a runway beam, so it was not easy, just straightforward to measure and to get some results from this, yeah. but we managed it. As you can see here, so here's the beam in the back. Yeah, and these kind of, of uh, images, I think sometimes it's it must be difficult to tell what is uh, runaway current and what is just uh, very high plasma current or no, no, no. here or reflection, as you said. Yeah, it's reflection, but it's also a reflection from there is no connect. Uh, there is no from runaway from the plasma current. It's only here's the effect. Uh, so it can be just a reflection of signal radiation from runaway electron from some other region. You know, it just that it is geometrically good. Let's say so. It, it's signal radiation for sure comes from signal from the runaway electrons, but it's for it. It means just it's not from the here you observe because it's on the wall, so probably somewhere like here, or maybe it's double reflection it's here. So it okay, what's happening? Here? Okay, so it can be whatever. This is the problem then, and this is why most of the images we recorded are not still uh, it's analyzed. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I talked with a guy from MIT, and he said, uh, "Oof, that is work on its own. I didn't have that much time." Yeah, so, yeah. That's about synchrotron. So you, you mentioned your you just recently published an article in Runaway Electron. Is that is that from your uh, previous work on Compass, or does that mean you're still involved with some Runaway project? Officially, I'm still I'm not yet on the project, but uh, we are waiting for some official, uh, let's say, framework yeah, to work officially. But yeah, I'm still in co communication with them, and uh, uh, I'm supposed now to do some analysis for them. But yeah, so we are in communication. And for people who would be interested in, I don't know, a, a master's thesis or a PhD or or postdoc work in, in runaways, like who who are the main players in uh, in this problem and, and what are the, I don't know, the mm -hmm. critical issues that they're tackling right now? Okay, so first just to answer, I didn't answer you, so the, 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 the thing I published is on, for my PhD, yeah. It's okay. just something. Yeah, but so this, so in Compass you have now a team of like five, six people, the Andre Ficker and Jan Mlinaj are the main in Compass. However, in the world, there is a very strong theoretical group in, in uh, Chalmers University in Göteborg, in Sweden. It's uh, Tunde Fulop is there in charge. She's working on our electrons, I think, for 20 years now or something, so in theory, so she's really good. In that, then she's collaborating with a team from Marseille. It's Yves Besson. They are developing this uh, complex, uh, uh, complex uh, <laughs> the random electron distribution uh, code, which practically does all what you can see actually on this figure, like this movement of the uh, distribution function and what's happening, and really like the the the, the very difficult math behind it and. Uh, and it's still not really satisfying with the experiment. <laughs> and then maybe, uh, then there is this guy, yeah, Robert Granitz, uh, who uh, had this, yeah, this guy. So he's from, he's that professor from MIT whom I asked about his reflections and everything. 
he was actually the most interested in my signal radiation works because at Arctur Simo they had also plenty of data from from infrared camera and visible camera because there is hematic field in Arctur Simo so they they had the uh, signal radiation visible so he is maybe one of the main guys and also there is Lennon in Eater yeah. Lennon in Eater and Loarte. Loarte is, I don't know, have you, have, has anybody of you heard of Loarte? But Loarte is like, we call him an Eater guy because he knows everything about fusion and Eater in general. So he's in every topic. So, yeah. And there is also, of course, team in K Star and uh, East. And I don't know people there. Uh, now, uh, 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 and TCV, uh, sorry, now I'm going to make too short. And TCV and Garhik, they, they have their own teams also. And uh, so that's it. And D3D is also with Eric Holman. I, I know if somebody's interested, you can write me and uh, I can write you, as you can see, like 10 at least people, like 10 teams who work on that topic. Theoretical experimental. You could, yeah, it seems, sounds like you could choose your favorite city and still be able to do a, uh, a PhD in, uh, in runaway electrons. Oh, some favorite city, maybe San Diego because of California, right? But, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Are, are there any more questions? Somebody else? What, yep, I see a hand. Oh, there's uh, Stefan, okay. Go ahead, <laughs> Stefan. If, if one would like to, to begin a PhD in uh, random electrons, I mean, uh, what, what could, I mean, what, what should he, he or she uh, start doing on, on experimental or on theoretical part? I think it's a very, it's a personal question, but I think, you know, I'm experimentalist, so I'm more for the experiment generally at the end. I'm, okay, now this is maybe, Ah, okay, off the record, but it will be on YouTube, but nobody will watch it. So, uh, when I was in one of these uh, workshops for Arab Electrons, there was this panel for meter, and we listened for these theoretical simulations and everything. And he told me uh, that he was really disappointed that they don't know actually what is ITER element, but they just, you know, look at the origin of generation of Arab Electrons and really detail, in really a lot of details, but then it's not ITER solving yeah so he was not very happy with that so i think that from that point of view for ether it's experiment it's really okay. solution yeah concrete solution we, because we need to, you need a theory to can so you can scale it up to ether but then um uh, it first needs to we need a theory that explains experiment not that uh, just explains you know the story behind but it's not helpful for the results yeah so that's it Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Last chance. <laughs> if okay. not, then thank you so much again, Milos, for joining the talks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're welcome. So it will be on YouTube, right? I can cut the last part out if you. Yes, that will be good. <laughs> <laughs> And well, the talk in two weeks is going to be again from somebody who's doing PhD on Compass, Ekaterina Matveva, on uh, disruptions and the effects of asymmetries. In yeah, with Pepper. Correct. So I'll look forward to see you all then and have a nice evening. I will try now to follow you. Yeah. <laughs> Bye.